Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Ramoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello, and welcome to the Pop Turnative podcast here on Blab. I'm your host, as always, Peter Ramoliotis, and on Twitter goes PD Beats. This is the podcast where we have topical discussions from the worlds of social media, sports, and pop culture. I'm really excited and looking forward to the panel that we have this year. We're going to talk hockey, athletes, and social media. We have a uh, reporter for TSN 1200 of Ian Mendez. Ian, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Peter. No problem. We have professional hockey player for the Connecticut Whale and the NWHL. We have Kaylee Fracken. Kaylee, welcome. Thanks for having me. And we have the assistant GM for the junior year Cumberland grads and the head coach of the midget triple A HEO Cumberland grads. We have coach Mark Rosh. Coach Mark, welcome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. So th- very quickly, I would just like you guys to give your opening remarks and introduce yourselves to the panel and our viewers. So Ian, let's start with you. Yeah. You know what? Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm a talk show host here in Ottawa, uh, mostly cover the Na- national hockey league and the, uh, the Ottawa senators have a, four hour talk show every day from two to six. So doing a half hour podcast here, this is going to just gonna fly by for me. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Kaylee, what about you? Uh, I'm Kaylee. I play for the Connecticut whale of the first ever um, women's paid professional hockey league. Um, so I play for the Connecticut whale. Um, I was living in Boston for the past five years. Uh, I went to Boston university. So I've kind of uh, headed towards Connecticut. So I'm living here now. Perfect. And Mark, best for last, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, a, I'm a coach. I've been coaching uh, for 26 years, uh, minor hockey and junior level, and uh, father of two uh, two kids involved in hockey and spend uh, every, uh, every waking hour at the rink. Great. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, having a coach, a player, and, you know, a reporter um, – from the hockey world, I think a really cool topic that I want to discuss is, you know, especially with, you know, the NHL All-Star game that happened and, you know, the NWHL having the All-Star game. He's talking about fan engagement and how over over the years, digital media and social media has drastically changed that. So from your perspectives, you know, a coach, a reporter, and a player, what, what, it, what do you think stands out the most when it comes to, you know, the changes you're seeing with, hockey players and fans engaging in general. Ian, what do you think about that? Well, I think we saw during the, uh, the NHL All-Star Weekend uh, fan engagement with the John Scott story uh, was, was a perfect example of how uh, professional sports leagues and teams need to pay attention to, uh, to fans. That maybe 20, 30 years ago, the engagement wasn't there, but you could tell that fans were outraged that somebody that they voted for, even if it was in jest or however – however you want to deal with the John Scott story, um, that was who they voted in. And when it seemed like there was a calculated effort from the league to sort of circumvent that policy and maybe get John Scott out out of the All-Star game, that certainly got fans upset. And they created a social media stir and they galvanized and they were able to make a change. And I think that's the the whole thing is that you find these little moments of uh, the fans being able to galvanize and have a voice that they didn't have five, even four or five years ago, but – that's what Twitter does for them now is allows fans that are all thinking something the same uh, to all get on board and they can pressure organizations into, into making changes that they think are, are, are the right changes. Uh, that's a good point. Kayla, what do you think about that? No, I agree completely. Um, I, I guess I, another thing about that is I've now gone, I guess, from a college level now to like a professional standpoint and being a professional player, just I've noticed – being more active on Twitter and being more active on your social media, like Instagram and Facebook and those types of things, fans want to hear from you. So like, I mean, I know it's a little bit different because we were talking about John Scott and the all-star, but uh, in turn of events in terms of interacting with the players from a, uh, sorry, the fans from a player standpoint, uh, fans love it. Fans love when you're tweeting at them, when you're responding individually to their messages or, um, you know, uh, those types of things. So I think, um, Years ago, when there wasn't Twitter and there wasn't those types of uh, social media, fans didn't feel like they could 
interact with players. And now I think that they feel like they can be a part of players lifestyle. So they can be a part of your training. So every day, if you take a picture of me in the gym or something like that, people love to see like what you're doing as a player. Yeah. Mark, what do you think about that? Cause you said, you know, you have over 20 years experience coaching. What do you think about that over the years, how that's changed and kind of the behind the scenes ad like access that Gilly's talking about that players and fans have access to. Yeah, and it's it, it reaches even broader because now um, leading into a team selection or once you've got your team put together, you can have an idea and really good insight as to where a player's head's at or what their where their head space is. Um, you know, um, night before a game, uh, as you're rec- or during tryouts, you know, if he's, uh, you know, you have a game at noon and you're in tryouts and he's up uh, tweeting an uh, awesome movie at uh, three in the morning, well, you know, where's his head at? You know, or every picture he has in, on his social media, he's holding a solo cup and, you know, like at a rave or stuff like that. It's pretty hard for him to believe that you've, you know, I, we had a, we had a kid uh, came into training camp saying, oh, yeah, I worked hard all summer coach and I'm ready to go get him. And, uh, you know, you go through his Twitter feed, his timeline, and his Facebook, and every other every other night he's out uh, at the bars and you know carrying on two three in the morning. So it's kind of saying, are you really putting in the work? So it's it's good for players that use it wisely, but it also uh, can become very detrimental for uh, for kids that uh, you know over divulge and overshare. Yeah, and Kayla, you played you played you know um, in Boston uh, in school, and one tweet that Mark put out a couple of. Uh, couple of weeks ago or a month ago uh, about how he spoke to a coach from NCAA and a scholarship was revoked because of stuff that was found on Twitter from this player. And Ian, I'm sure you can comment on this as well. It You have to be careful what's, what you post on those platforms. And maybe that's why a lot of athletes, Kaylee, are not posting that much because they're afraid. Well, we, I guess from my freshman year to my senior year, even the social media uh, constraints that our coaches put upon us changed a lot. So uh, my freshman year wasn't that prominent. And then when about my senior year, our coaches were very, um, they actually created their own Facebook and they created their own um like one for the team. I, I think actually our, our team Facebook or our coaches Facebook was called like Walter Brown arena, which was our arena, but they just made like a sublet kind of account. And that way they could keep track of what players were tweeting and, or what they were posting. And if it was unacceptable or what they felt wasn't a good kind of representation of our team, you would have to take it down. And, um, and, and I know a lot of programs have done that now, and that's kind of the best way to make sure that their players aren't posting things that they shouldn't be posting. Ian, what do you think about that? Also, to a professional level as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, I tell, I, I speak to a lot of young, um, asp- kind of students that want to get into journalism and want to get into broadcasting, and I tell them all about digital footprint. You're leaving a digital footprint, and when you're 16, 17, 18, you think that you're indestructible. No one's paying attention. Your social media network might be small. Well, guess what? When you're 21, 22, 23, and all of a sudden you're trying to get a job or you're trying to get on a team, and it's very easy, as, uh, as as Mark was saying, very easy to just simply Google search somebody and look back and see what their digital footprint is. So I, I think it's really important you tell, especially kids that are in sort of just beyond middle school, like so into, into grade 8, 9, 10, be careful what you're doing. Be careful what you're posting and understand that you're not just talking to your friends in the basement. You're now available to everybody. And you might say something that you think is funny, but five years from now, it's not that funny. And you got to be really careful. So I think that's, it's really important. Like social media is great. There's a lot of really uh, beneficial things to it. I think it's great to engage with people. I think it's great to connect. I think there's a great ways to share information, but it can be really dangerous for people who don't know how to use it. And that's why it's really important to tell young people and teach young people and show young people how to use it properly. The, that's a great point. Like a couple of years ago, uh, Larry Nance Jr., when he was in college, uh, yeah. he put out a tweet. He put out a tweet saying, uh, you know, after the whole Kobe Bryant incident, and he said, you know, I uh, hope he has a better trip this time in Denver, hashtag rapist. And he took it down right away. And then it was a screen capture. And then fast forward two years later, he's drafted by the LA Lakers. And, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, teammate Kobe, how you doing? And it was it was taken down immediately, screen captured, and went viral again. You know, and it was it was just put on there for a few minutes. And he took it down and he, you know, had to apologize. And so it's just, you know, two seconds, two clicks, and it could be, it could be there permanently. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely. And there was also, there, there was a post to, I forget, there, there, there was a lot of stuff as well uh, where with Super Bowl too. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pandemonium with that. There, there was a tweet where uh, Cam Newton, uh, so Cam Newton obviously wasn't happy to uh, that he lost Super Bowl. And there was that whole thing about how he wasn't responding to, he walked on our reporters and someone tweeted something that came off racist and r right away you know it was it was taken down but we've had guests that come on that talk about this as well it like you there's an, almost no room for mistakes at times it's so quick that people are going to capture it right away right Kaylee? well yeah that's what happens is even when you're at an event or or whatever you're doing. And I, I myself will find myself tweeting and, and you, you, you kind of just go about it so quickly. And then you, you press tweet and then you're like, Oh gosh, I can't even go back to fix that. And so it's one of those things that you have to be aware of. And uh, I, myself, when I, every time I tweet, I think about, well, how do I want to be represented as a player? Like, how do I want people to view me now that I'm a professional? Like, well, even regardless, <laughs> just in general, how do you want to be viewed by the public is because you're, you're building yourself a brand. Everyone has their own brand. And, yeah. and it, it's one of those things where would you like your brand to be a particular way or would you like it to be another? So it, it like, like Ian and Mark were saying it, you know, social media can be an absolute great thing. And then it could be your worst enemy also. No, that, that, that is, that is a good point. And another thing too, is like, Ian, you know, now, like when you talk about brands, like sports brands, like you know, reporters, like you have a brand. Ian Mendez is a brand. You have over forty thousand followers on Twitter. It that that's something that that's a really cool, interesting thing about social media. It's embedded. It's part of the everyday life as a reporter, right? So there's a brand that you necessarily didn't maybe have before digital media was so like and like um and like so prominent. Yeah, well, absolutely. I think. The only danger that I find with, with Twitter is unfortunately it becomes and um, it almost becomes this little badge of, oh, how many followers do you have? And well, I guess this person's more credible than the other person because they have so many followers that that part's always bothered me about social media, that the people that have more followers somehow have more credibility. And that's not always the case. It shouldn't be the case that uh, people have 30,000 followers or anything that I say is more relevant than somebody who has 30 followers. It's It's simply not true. It's just. Uh, the unfortunate, uh, um, the unfortunate uh, way that it works, but I, I do agree that there's a there's a brand. Like uh, you know, I used to work in TV, and I worked on uh, I worked with Sportsnet for 12 years, and I simply um, took my Twitter account and just moved it over to TSN Radio when I joined TSN Radio because my my Twitter account's mine. It's portable. It's no matter where I go, I have it. And you're right, that, yeah. Peter. That wasn't there three, four, five years ago when a reporter left a news outlet. That was it. You were mm -hmm. attached to that news outlet. You had no other platform. If you were in between jobs or if you moved networks or whatever, you didn't have anything. Right now, yeah. if I get let go tomorrow um, from my job, I'll still have theoretically an audience. It's just a question of what can I what can I do with it. But that that's true. You can. It's sort of portable. You can take it wherever you go. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. Before I, Mark, I, I have a question. Uh, like specifically like about coaching but Ian before you go I, ha I have to bring it up because when I was doing research for the show uh, you know you said you know a lot of things you know like that are posted on the internet live on the internet and one thing that's that that that's living on the internet is that clip where you know you uh, you were about to do a uh, report of baseball that you got clipped with a foul ball I did yeah <laughs> and you dealt with that like a champ and then like Right before you go on, you're like, oh, it stinks. And I was like, hey, me too. What? And you did the report. Yeah. I took my hat. I took my hat off for you to that, sir. That was like, the greatest thing ever. It's one of my favorite videos. Oh, you know what? I, it's funny because I'm like, I'm like the least tough guy ever. Like I'll, I'll get a hangnail, <laughs> I'll get a hangnail, and I'll just yeah. like, that day, like yeah. when I was doing live TV, you just knew like I got hit right in the ankle bone with this ball that came out of nowhere uh, during, the, <laughs> during the World Series in. Uh, in San Francisco in 2012 and I had literally five seconds to go on air. So I'm wincing and they're like, okay, you're live. And then I had to fake it. Like I'm okay. And you know what? As soon as I was done, the hit, the people at sports that asked, they're like, do you mind if we tweet this out? Cause we think this is going to go viral. And it, had a mil <laughs> it had a million hits in like 12 hours. Yeah. 
reporter gets beaten with baseball. Had a million hits. So it was like, yeah, wow. Mark, Mark and Caleb, if you haven't seen that, just Google Ian Mendez. I haven't. I got to check that out. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And Ken, Kenny yeah. Reed, who, Ken Reed, who, uh, yeah. I suppose like he he's supposed to come on the show soon at one point, but his like narration and like his background voice to it is so funny too. Where he's like, "Ian yeah. Mendes, what a pro!" Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. But yeah, Mark, you know, being a what I find interesting about you, like being a coach as well, is you know you don't think about coaching and social media as much. You know what I mean? Not like a lot. Like coaches are not like very active on social media if they are active they probably like have accounts they don't do much about it right? and the one thing i find interesting about you is you are very active on social media but it's also part of your brand as well like your twitter handles at coach mark one right so yeah. it's like you, you your your brand is like a coach right rather than someone who is like rather than just being like mark frosh one and it's like yeah you know i'm a hockey coach but it's part of your overall brand but the funny part was is that uh, when it all started, like when I, whenever it started, it was the Google machine because I'm the, you know, it was the old fat fuddy duddy coach. And so I put it and they, all the kids call me Coach Mark. So I said, well, you know, I want to get on this Twitter to see what the kids are doing. And, you know, and so I was just kind of just watching. And, you know, at first I was saying, you know, what does it mean when you put the, the hashtag? Does it mean you're swearing or like I had no clue. So I was just kind of do it as a passive, you know, as a passing kind of interest just to keep track of the kids and then after that when I saw, started seeing the advantages of you know being able to put out your message to a wider audience and again like like Ian says like the, whether whether you have 20 followers or it depends who follows you if all your team follows you and you're kind of putting out like inspirational pep stock stuff or you know about being smart about you know being creating your brand and you know what the uh, when your posts and what your posts say about you. And again, it's all about branding. If you, you know, you put yourself out as a gym rat, yet you're, you know, you never, you never talk about going to the gym. Well, it's kind of, you know, you have to walk the walk and uh, talk the talk. It's talk is cheap. So that's why like by able, you know, by using Twitter, you're able to put your brand out there and be able to tell everybody what's important to you. Yeah, and you know, for people who are watching, I, I highly recommend you you uh, you follow Mark. Well, follow all of our our, our panelists. Not that Ian needs their help because he's already at forty thousand. But you know, <laughs> I, I guess we could help the Ian Mendez because you you did get hit by a foul ball, so uh, exactly I we could help the friend. But Kaylee, the one thing too that I I, I think interesting um, is you know the NWHL. NWHL, excuse me, it's it's a new it's it's a new league, right? So you know, there's gonna be a lot of uh, there, there's gonna be like whether it's like for you adapting as a player from the NWHL or the league, there's gonna be a lot of um, getting used to it, right? So how like what made you want to be so you know because you are pretty active on social media. You may you don't necessarily like tweet like like two times a day, but you're pretty active. There's a lot of stuff like coming out. What made you want to be like, yeah, you know, I want to be a, like an athlete that is, you know, has a active feed on social media. Was there anything that came to mind when that, like uh, when you were thinking about it? Um, I guess one of the things for me was um, the more I started to become active, the fans at games actually got more comments about it. So when we were in uh, doing like autograph signing or you'd be interacting with fans after the game, I'd have particular people come up to me and be like, oh, I love like what you were putting out on social media. Like I love like uh, we were doing a stick drive. So for the amount of one of my teammates and I were doing a stick drive during um, the Christmas holidays and we were going to for every so many followers, we were going to donate a stick to um to a kid that was in need that couldn't afford a hockey stick. And, and so we decided to do this through social media and, and the fans loved it and people started to get interactive about it. And then people at games were coming up to us and it just became something that caught fire. And I noticed that the more I started to get involved with the fans and, and uh, I mean, not tweeting every second, but doing kind of fun, different things like that. Like even actually for Valentine's day, um, uh, the same teammate of mine uh, decided to um, kind of get interactive with the fans again and uh, see who could come up with the best kind of funny Valentine's Day card for these NWHL players. And so I just found it was a neat way to connect with fans and, and get to know people because it's a little bit different. The NWHL is a small branch of players uh, that are just becoming professionals and, and 
And we have an opportunity because we are a small group of people to actually interact with our fans where you have professional athletes like LeBron James or any player in the, the NHL that, um, you know, has uh, millions of followers and has a bigger fan base. So for them to individually connect with so-and-so that tweets to them, um, it, it, it's a lot harder for them to do. So um, I just found that it was a good way that to – to connect with the fans and, and let the fans know that, um, you know, we are normal people as well. And even though we are on a smaller scale, um, of things as female athletes, uh, they have an opportunity to do that with us. No, that, that is a good point. Ian, it looked like you were maybe going to say something or agree, or you were, (laughs) you were nodding your head a lot there. So I'm not sure what's, uh, (laughs) no, I, I think it's, it's true. It's, I think that's to me, that's the appeal of, um, of, of sports and athletes that that don't have millions of followers like it's to me it's great i think it's it's great that you can connect with um with your fans on a one-to-one basis that they actually feel a personal connection that they feel like when they come to watch your game uh in connecticut they feel like oh i you know what i know her oh, I, I tweeted at her yesterday and she wrote back or she favorited my tweet where like you go to an nba game or you go to an nfl game and uh you know i you know a lot of players are great on on twitter but there's no sense of personal connection. There's just a sense of, I like this player. I enjoy watching them, but there's, there's absolutely no personal connection. And I think that's, to me, that's what, uh, that's what makes that really cool. What do you think about that personal connection, Mark? Like that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny because uh, we, uh, the, the junior team, we had a recent uh, third jersey unveiling and it was a black jersey. So uh, we were, you know, they were talking about, you know, famous people in black. And we said, you know, the most famous of them all is uh, Johnny Cash, the man in black. And then after that, uh, you had like a bunch of legit country stars that were favoriting and liking it, you know, just liking your tweet. Well, where else can you have like Nashville stars like a, like a tweet about Johnny Cash from a team from that's based out of Navin, a town of 900 people, you know, so it's, it's, it's wide ranging or, you know, you put a, a Super Bowl hashtag on it or, you know, on things and you have people from halfway around the world you know, will like it or favorite it or, you know, retweet it. And it's, it's, you know, it's just very, you know, it's, it's open access. And again, if you're putting it out there and you're able to see like a, like the NWHL, well, you know, I've got a eight year old daughter at home and it gives her role models. And it, it, you know, before that, like good luck trying to find it on TV or, but this way she can look at, she can see, she can say like, geez, I want to be like, I want to be one of those girls someday, you know, and it's all the, the, you know, it spins out and that's why the personal contact is so, is so, uh, so unbelievable. And it is nice when, when they, you know, the big stars and your role models are able to reach out to them fans no that that's a lot of uh that that is a, that is a good point and you know get it back to what you said about the nwhl mark about uh uh what, what another question for you Kelly, is what what is that like what, what's that like you know now having a platform where you're a role model right where you know you're you're, you're showcased as a professional you know hockey player women hockey player in a league that was not there before, what 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 goes through your head in that in that in that moment? Well, it's pretty it's a pretty cool thing because I grew up with two older brothers that played hockey, and so for me, my role models were them. Uh, I played male hockey growing up, and uh, I always had them to look up to, and I had Olympic players to look up to, but there still wasn't a there weren't really female role models for me in, in women's hockey. Um, I guess I would, I I should say. And, and, and now like I coach minor hockey here in the Connecticut area. So I'm helping girls out from the ages of like five to 13. And um, those girls come to my games. So I'll be in the stands and these girls will have little um, signs that say, go coach Kaylee. And I think it's an unbelievable thing for these girls that their own coach is playing at a level where these girls can aspire to get to. So they can say, you know, my coach who comes to my practices every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is also a professional hockey player, and I can aspire to be like her. And so it kind of gives them that personal connection again and, and shows them that it's, it's, it's a reality and that it's, a, it's an actual thing and that these girls can aspire to get there. And then I can also help them. So they can also turn to me and say, hey, coach, like, what do I need to work on so like, I can get to the next level? 
or, you know, um, you know, what did you do as a kid that helped you or what made you realize like you wanted to play hockey seriously or competitively? So, um, it, it, it's kind of makes me feel a little bit old at times <laughs> that I look back and I'm like, oh gosh, I'm actually a role model for kids now where I still think and I still look to my brothers all the time and look at them as still my role models and I still call them for questions. But um, uh, it's a it's a neat thing and it, it's awesome that you can give back to these kids now, these girls now. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, am I the only one that doesn't see Ian, Ian, Ian? Yeah, you don't see him either. Okay. Yeah, he went rogue. Oh, well, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. Her, his connection was uh, Ian. If you hear us, just call back in. Oh, he's called back in. I think we're good. There it is. Yeah, we're just we're just waiting for him to come in. But yeah, no, that, that that's really cool. Uh, I I'm really uh, I'm I'm really happy, you know, to speak. Uh, like like you are. So uh, Kaylee is not the first uh, NWHL player we've had on the show. We've we've had your roommate a former teammate. Yeah. <laughs> and what was really cool about that is we had Chelsea on the show like uh, but like a like re really, really early mm -hmm. in you know the the the, the career of the NWHL. And you know, she had she had some stuff to say, but there were a lot of unknowns. We didn't, you didn't know how it was gonna play out. So I find it's really refreshing to have you on now, you know, after like the All-Star and Mark, you know, Kaylee is an NWHL All Star, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, I knew that. And um, I, I think you're one of the you, you are uh, the leading scorer uh, in defense, I believe, right, or up there, right, in, in the league. Is that is that a true fact? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that, that's really cool. But yeah, no, I, I think we've we've lost Ian. But uh, you know, it was it was it was cool to have cool to have him on. He had to leave early anyway because he has to uh, do some uh, Detroit Red Wings sense game post game stuff. But we'll, we'll try to maybe get him on one more time, and then we'll see. But I, I think that you know, this, these are like the conversations I wanted to have. I think it's really really interesting to have the perspective from a coach or for like Ian and, a, and and someone who's part of the show, like. Who's actually playing Kaylee? Part of it all, you know. It, it it's it's a it's a new world. It's it's really different um, with social media. And what what do you what are some things if we could if we could pinpoint some you know things that you you want to change? What are some of the things that you you want like in terms of social media and how fans use it? What are some of the things that you think need work or that could be changed in terms of how we you know? take on social media as these platforms part of our everyday lives. Mark, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's um, like, it, it gets difficult because there is no filter right before that. And that's what, that's what the, the great part is, is you get instantaneous news. It's no, it's not controlled by the media. It's not controlled by a, you know, a monthly billion dollar conglomerate. It's, it's, um, it's quick and it's it's but it's it's also it could be a bit reckless like um you take for example in and around ottawa uh the horrible events of october 22nd um when uh, when the corporal was uh, was uh, was shot shot at the cenotaph well you had a whole bunch of people tweeting oh i've, I've heard shots fired there's a guy in a motorcycle uh, on the 417 shooting a machine gun you know they and it was it it got to be like people, it, you know, it was pandemonium. You had people that were doing it. I don't know if they thought they were being helpful or they thought they were just being uh, mischievous or whatever, but it, it, it becomes an issue, right? And it's, but the other good side of it is, is, you know, when, when there's a, when, you know, there's certain things like there's an earthquake or there's a horrible incident, it, there's the people could live report, uh, you know, this place is safe, this, you know, go to this area, this is good. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know that uh, why Twitter has 144 characters is because you could, you could tweet with an old dial up phone, you know, the old like flip phone. You, so even if you don't have your access, you don't have access to Wi-Fi, you could still use you could put out stuff on Twitter just by using the old flip phone. So, you know, it's always, you know, we always tell people to have one around, you know, just to, just to be able to get in emergency contact. So the good parts of it is there is no, no restraints, but the bad part is, is the same thing. You know, what makes it so good can also make it very bad. They're going to change that too, though. I, I, I heard they're going to make it longer. It's going to be more than 140 characters. So, 
There's sure. a lot of talk about that as well. Yeah, Caleb, what about you? I mean, there's a lot of discuss discussions about like the negativity on social media. So what what do you what do you think about that as well in terms of some obstacles that we have to overcome? I guess it's just um, when you talk about negativity and people can tweet out anything and, and I think it just comes to the fact of uh, you're going to believe what you want to believe. So there's all those things where there's negativity that's put out through Twitter and uh, you know, someone's tweeting one thing and then someone's tweeting the other. And then I think it just comes down to um, there's so much um, accessibility for everyone and everyone has the opportunity to say whatever they want that it's kind of like you have to take it at your discretion. So I think one of the things that like I have found through social media, it's like you kind of want to, you choose what you want to believe or you choose what uh, you want to take from it. So um, I guess, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, we're, 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 it's still young and it's growing every day. And I think that, uh, no, I think we had really, really good discussions. And I, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up this, this, this episode soon. Um, but a couple of questions to, um, for, for Mark as well, you know, how do you, like, I, I want to just like, not, not about social media, digital media. I want to talk about hockey a little bit. And I want to talk, Kaylee, you coach minor hockey as well. So I want to talk about hockey development for a little bit as well, Mark, you know, over the years, um, are we, have there been any changes in your views about how, you know, we are developing hockey players? Do you think there are, there are like, I'm, I'm sure you could write a whole book or two on that, Mark. <laughs> With all your experience. Probably, probably color a book, but not write it. Um, <laughs> the, the, what I've noticed, the biggest thing is that, um, like it's uh, about paying to get better. Like uh, the the academies, the you know the prep schools. Uh, you know, you're, you, you there's all sorts of places that every t every time you turn, there's somebody else that's looking for their you know putting your hand in the parent's pocket, saying, well, you know, if he's on the ice four hours a day, he'll be better than the kid that's on four hours a week. So uh, you know, it's it's it used to be like hockey. Like and again, I I played a like. I played competitive when I was younger, which was like 40 years ago. And, um, you know, like it, it was like for like lower middle class played hockey, but in this, like in Canada now it's upper middle class. And in some places in the States, like you have to be flat out loaded. Um, you know, your parents have to be very well off. Like uh, one of my cousins uh, moved to Los Angeles and, um, you know, it's uh, $40,000 a year. Uh, for them to play peewee hockey they had a state team he would they were flying back here for the bell capital cup uh, they you know all their tournaments were in the east coast so i just found over the past like last 10 years really it's become a rich kid sport and you know like um I don't know, like it just seems like the kid that wants to play and wants to be good, he doesn't need to have like, you know, be coached and double coached and private lessons, edge work, stick handling and all this. If you can go to the outdoor rink, that's where you create, you know, passion for the game and create, you know, the, the individual skills. But it just seems like they, the parents are willing to buy or being told to buy, you know, a AAA or junior or NCAA success, which is really, uh, really unfortunate. Kelly, can you, can you comment on that quickly about, you know, that is an interesting part of like the, it's, it's an expensive game to, like for kids to, to play. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's just all across the board up until you get to, I guess, a college level or up until you are playing to a level to get a scholarship to play college or even to go off to WHL, OHL, whatever it may be. But I mean, I grew up with, I was a, the youngest of two older brothers and all three of us played hockey. Um, so you can imagine the amount of money that our parents would shell out doing that. And, and even then, you know, my, my mom used to joke, she'd be like, are you sure you want to do summer hockey? Are you sure you want to do spring hockey? Because I'd like to take that money that we pay for that and put it into a vacation. Cause we could go some, you know, we could go on a summer vacation. And, and, and that's one of those things is, you know, it's kind of gotten to a point, like Mark is saying that all these people feel like they need to pay $40,000 a year for their kid to go to this academy, because they feel that if they go to this academy, then they have an opportunity to get a scholarship to go here or off to school, or even in the States, when you kind of take it from, from that aspect, people think that they need to send their kids to $40,000, $50,000 a year prep schools. 
Mm -hmm. So their kid will, you know, go off to uh, an Ivy League school. So it's kind of the mentality that has changed for development where, um, you know, these parents are more concerned as to, you know, what team to get their kid on or, um, you know, kind of what program to get involved with uh, so that to kind of get to that next level, which which isn't true. And I, I, I there's plenty of plenty of examples where kids can go playing you know regular minor hockey um or for that matter not even play on triple a teams and that's another thing whole nother thing to talk about is a kid doesn't have to play on the best team ever um or get the best coaching ever if if they're on the ice and and putting in the time and effort um and, and yes uh coaching and and good development is definitely uh, going to help your kid get better, but, um, you know, just the old fashioned getting out on the rink and, and doing a lot of practices is going to get you a long way because at the end of the day, a lot of it has to come down to desire and your own motivation and determination to get better. No, that, that's what it is. And, you know, I saw there, there, there were a few, like Mark, you know, there was uh, on CTV Ottawa, there was a story, uh, I I believe in CTV Ottawa about, about this, about what you said about it being very expensive, so it's like it's a topical, fresh uh, discourse. I, I I think you know in in, in the sports world. Um, but yeah, no, I think we're gonna wrap up this episode. I really appreciate uh, Kaylee you coming on the show, Mark. Uh, you know, Mark is the first coach to ever come on Pop Alternative, so I think that's that's a pretty cool honor, right, Mark? Oh, jeez, yeah, <laughs> there. Maybe I'll get a ring or something. <laughs> Kaylee, you unfortunately weren't the first hockey player to come on we actually had the social media no we also had the social media oh. le legend zach boychuk on the show oh okay right awesome. and uh <laughs> and uh it was great to have ian on as well you know it got it, it got cut short we had some difficult difficulties but it was really cool to have him on you know i remember as a kid watching him uh, on sports that covering you know uh, hockey and and uh baseball so it was, it was really cool to have a discussion so uh, any closing remarks you know any, any accounts that we need to follow or anything you want to say or give a shout out to mark no just uh just uh, if any of the boys uh, go to bed got a big weekend uh, <laughs> two big games this weekend so we've got to get back on the winning track did anyone watch it or was anyone interested in the show like, was it was it mentioned in the practice before that you're going on oh, no. no 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 i don't uh, <laughs> i don't self-promote i better be in bed by now for god's sakes we lost this weekend <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kaylee, what about you? Any any closing remarks? Or? No, not well. Good luck, Mark. I, I <laughs> know the feeling on that. So we got a big weekend in Boston. So we got to pull out a win because we're just one. We're in first place by one point. So yeah, been uh, watching clinch, clinch that regular season title. So yeah. good luck to you. Thanks. Yeah. You too. Perfect. Well, this has been Pop Alternative. Thank you all. You can catch uh, previous episodes of Pop Alternative on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and you can like us and follow us, like us on uh, on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Pop Alternative. Thank you all, and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Alternative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Pop Alternative on YouTube. Be sure to like Pop Alternative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter.